you will turn me in your Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. I'm going to take a little break from Peter. Gospel of John. We're going to be looking at something that, to be honest with you, you probably don't look at a whole lot. We look at the Passion Week. But what happened right before Jesus rode in to Jerusalem? We're going to look at that today and talk about that. Before we go into God's Word, let's go to Him in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank You that we can take not just a day, but Father, take a week to remind ourselves of the love and the joy and the pain and the sacrifice that was given because you loved us. And so, Father, I pray as we meditate on the things that took place this week, that you would help us to reflect not just on the tremendous sacrifice, but the tremendous love behind the sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whenever I study a passage or a book, what I'll do is I'll get a couple of uh, commentaries. I'll do my own study and I'll listen to different speakers. And I heard a speaker share this this week and I stole it from him, but it was a good story. And it ties into what we're going to talk about today. There was an 85-year-old man and uh, he had come to, he knew he was coming to the end of his life. He just couldn't function the way he used to. He's alone now and he had saved up for this retirement and he realized he's got all this money and nowhere to go, so he did what any man would do. He went and bought a convertible Corvette. <laughs> he took that out uh, to ride. It's 60. The wind in his hair, 70. 80. 90. He said to himself, I've never been 100. He hit 100. When he hit 100, the, the road in front of him started to change color. This kind of nice blue flashing tint. And he looked up in the rearview mirror <laughs> and said, oh, no. And so he floored it. 110, 120, 130, 140. And he caught himself. And he said, what, what am I doing? So he pulled over. Police officer asked him to step out of the car. He's angry. <clears throat> There's no idea why he was acting so recklessly. And this is what he said to him. He said, sir, it is Friday. I've got 30 minutes before my shift is over. I personally don't want to do any paperwork. If you can give me a good reason, one I've never heard before, why you were doing what you were doing, I might let you off. Well, he panicked. He knows he's going to jail if he doesn't come up with something. He sat and thought. He said, a few years ago, officer, my wife ran off from a state policeman and I thought he was trying to bring her back. <laughs> <laughs> officer tipped his hat and said, have a good day, sir, and he walked off. <laughs> now, why do I share that? If you've ever been pulled, or ever had the blue lights behind you, there's this awful feeling that comes over you. And most of the time, we know what we were doing. Sometimes we don't. But if you get a police officer, he tells you what you've done wrong, and then he lets you off. There's no greater relief. There's appreciation and a gratefulness. And there's sometimes we do this. I'll never do that again. Until next week. I don't know if you've ever been in severe trouble. I don't know if you've ever been in the spot where you needed deliverance from. And then you get it. And the gratefulness and the thankfulness and the indebtedness you feel. There's just this great relief that takes place. Today is Palm Sunday. At Ephesus, when I think of Palm Sunday, I think of the kids coming down and the, I think of Patty Loving and Nancy Tigner. I think of all that, a lot of things that we do and getting ready for Easter, but really what it is, it's the beginning of a deliverance. It's the 
beginning of a Passover, if you will, where we were under judgment, if you will, and we got passed over, we were let off. We're going to talk about that today. It's important to, to God, if you will, because out of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're going to be in John. All four Gospels talk about this this week. John, if you think about it, I believe John has 21 chapters in it. John begins talking about the last week of Christ in chapter 12, which means almost, almost half of John is on the last week of Jesus' life on earth. Matthew, two-fifths of his book is about the last week. Luke, one-third of his gospel is about the last week. Mark, three-fifths is about the last week. I heard this this week, too. I thought this was interesting. There's 89 chapters total. <coughs> All the Gospels have 89 chapters. Out of those 89, four chapters cover the first 30 years of Christ's life. The rest cover the last three and a half years of his life. But 29 total verses cover the last week. It's a big deal. And, and there's a lot of detail. And I want to start, if you will, at verse 12. Let's see. Hold on. John 12. John chapter 12. Just making sure I'm, I'm backtracking just a little bit. Let's backtrack a little bit. Let's go to verse 1. Let's do that. Let's do it this morning. Are right, y'all ready? It says, Then... Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, and there they had made him a supper. You see, that shows you they're Baptist. <laughs> Celebrate everything with a supper. Lazarus has been raised from the dead. He's coming through Bethany. That's where his friends are. And they make him a dinner. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil. Some will have nard, some will have spike nard, and anointed his feet, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Verse 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, now listen, we know how the story unfolds. And we kind of read into it. But I want you to think about this for a second. The, the, the oil that she has poured on Jesus' feet, you want to know how much it takes to get that cologne, that perfume? There's different levels of perfume. I like the $20 range. But there's some that I really like. It's in the $200 range. I just smell it in the store. <laughs> this perfume takes you a year of income to buy. A year. And Judas, a disciple of Jesus Christ, let's not say he's the traitor yet. He's a godly disciple, follower of Jesus Christ. And this is what he says. Verse 5. Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii, that's a year's worth of wages, and given to the poor? Now, I want, you to, I want to remind you of a very important truth. This is true for the rest of your life. God says man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. If we were in a room and that took place and somebody said that, some of us would go, wow, what a great guy. Wow, he, he's thinking smart. He's trying to expand the kingdom of God. He's taking something valuable, trading it for money in order to feed the poor. Listen, we don't know what's going on in people's hearts. But God does. And I hear this verse said all the time. Judge not lest you be judged. And they use it for the wrong reason. God and Jesus both tell us we're to judge rightly. We are to judge. If Mia's running out in traffic, I'm to judge that and go, that is bad, stop what you're doing. If 
if a relative is destroying themselves with drugs, I am to judge and say, you're destroying yourself, let me get you help. What most people mean when they say, judge not, lest you be judges, don't tell me what's right and wrong. That's not what he's talking about. God's saying we are never to judge a book by its cover. Somebody comes here all tatted up and spiked hair, I'm not to judge him and go pagan. I'm also not to judge and condemn. Oh, she's going to hell. Oh, you see how he's acting a lot? He needs to go to hell. We're not to ever judge like that. Which ones do Christians judge the best at? Discerning right and wrong and helping people or condemning? The reason we're not to judge a book by its cover is because we can't look at the inward heart. Only God can see a heart. We look at the outward appearance. This sounds really, really good on the outside until you are told what his motives are. Verse 6. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. And he used to take what was put in it. Listen, if you were a disciple and you were following a rabbi and you had 12 and somebody was the money watcher, who do you put in charge of the money? Someone you truly what? They don't know yet. They don't know. Let's keep going. Verse 7. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have, or the poor you will always, will always be with you. But me, you, do not have always. Now Jesus wasn't being callous there. What he's saying is, my time is short. I'm not going to be here forever. You can take care of the poor forever. My days are numbered. They didn't know what was going on yet. And listen, and Jesus didn't chasten her for what she was doing. Um... She held nothing back. I was listening to some people this week and this struck a chord with me. She didn't hold anything back. She gave it all. She didn't say, should I do this? Should I not do this? She gave everything she had to Jesus and Jesus didn't stop her. Listen, we're so reserved. I know this about all of us, including me. So I'm not throwing stones at y'all. This is me too. We are such a reserved people. Even if we go to a big men's conference, and people get a little crazy. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, crazy. What we do before we go there is we look to see if everybody else is doing it before we do it. Because we don't want to what? Look foolish. And before we laugh at that, we do it with other things. We go to the funeral home, and I hear this at a funeral home a lot. Don't cry. Don't cry. They're in a better place. You don't need to cry. Don't cry. And what do we do? So I could have, listen, I do it. I had somebody come one talk to me today. I had somebody come talk to me this week, and this is what I want to do. I'm not going there. If I go there, something's going to break, and I don't need to break. I want my happy face on. We are very reserved, and we hold back, and we watch to see what everybody else is doing, but not her. When she when she worshipped, she gave him everything. Verse nine. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. And listen to this. This is awesome. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Listen, I'm that person. If I knew Lazarus was dead, I went up to the funeral home, we saw him put in the ground, and I heard he was raised from the dead, I'm going to the supper. I want to see if this is the real deal. I want to see if Lazarus is alive, and that's what they're doing. Verse 10. But the chief priest, listen to this. The chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Listen, if we went to, God forbid, let me find somebody I can pick on and won't be offended. We're in the United States now. Thank you, J.D. Stamper. Um, if I went to, God forbid, J.D. Stamper's funeral, and I'm an atheist, and he's a Christian. And he's telling me how great his God is. And then he dies. And I go to his funeral service. And then I hear that he was raised from the dead. And he is up at Java Jack's eating breakfast. <laughs> and I go up there and I see he's eating. 
And I know it's Him. Instead of going, maybe, just maybe, J.D. was telling me the truth. Do you know what some people will do? They'll try to kill him. Because we don't want the proof, and I don't want to believe that. And this goes against what I believe, so I need to kill the messenger. And, and I'm just going to share this with you, Christians, to be honest with you. Have you all seen people lately who don't want to believe anything, even if you put all the evidence right out in front of them? They're going to believe what they want to believe. And if you give them the evidence, they'll dispute the evidence without ever looking at it. And if you show them video, they'll say it was, it was forged. And if you say, come here and touch it and feel it and smell it, they'll go, it's all fake. Because they know if I believe what is in front of me, then I have to admit something in me. Maybe, just maybe, I am wrong. And Americans, excuse me, and we're all guilty of this, are so proud, we have a hard time saying I am wrong and I am sorry. That's where these Pharisees are. Listen, people are going off desires and feelings right now. Would you all agree? And some will refuse to believe Jesus, not because of the lack of evidence, but because if they admit it's true, and they have to admit some things about themselves. Verse 12. The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Now, test time. The person who gets this will win a car from Marion Acres. <laughs> the word Hosanna what does that mean? Does anybody know? Save us. Save us. Did you Google it? Yeah. You're so good. She didn't cheat. Mary, we'll have your car for you out back as soon as you're... No, I'm joking about that. Most people think Hosanna means praise. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is not what that word means. It means save us or rescue us. Jesus is coming... They're taking the palm branches. That's why it's called Palm Sunday. They're putting it out on the road. And they're putting the robes out by other gospels and everything else. And the masses are yelling, Save us! Save us! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The first time this word is used about Jesus, right here. The King of Israel. Now wait, before you get excited, I want you to know something. Some of these people are the same one that's going to be yelling, Crucify, crucify, by." the end of the week. What do they want saving from? Does anybody know? The Romans. Romans. The Romans. Now, Jesus comes riding in on a donkey, and, and that was prophesied. If you look down at verse 14, it says, Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey of colt. That was 500 years earlier in the book of Zechariah. And well, like I prophesied that, and he's riding in, and there's a reason for that. If a king was coming into a country or coming into a place, and he was on a horse, on a steed, it meant judgment or war or both. But if a king rode into a country on a donkey, it meant that he was trying to broker peace. The thing that they're yelling, save us, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he, that comes from, and I want y'all to write this down so you can read it later, is Psalm 118. It's a messianic psalm. It's a psalm about the Messiah. It's about God coming to save them. And they're singing this. So they're singing about the Messiah from a messianic uh, psalm, Psalm 118. John quotes this prophecy. Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy. Look at verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. They missed it, just like we do sometimes. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had been done, that, I'm sorry, and they had done these things to him. Now, as Jesus rides in and they're praising him and yelling, King of Israel and all that, something happens that only happens twice in the four Gospels. It happens once at Lazarus' funeral service, if you will. They're graveside. He's been buried a number of days, and they're weeping. 
and they're broken and they're, they're asking this question, kind of like the question we asked last week. Jesus, where are you? If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. But it happened. Why didn't you come? And he sees all the grief and all the pain and says, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the English Bible. He weeps again here. You don't see it in the Gospel of John, but if you go to the Gospel of Luke, Luke 19, verse 42, this is what he says. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Listen, they're yelling good stuff. And he's weeping. Because they don't get it. Well, what is it they don't get? Let's, let's look. He saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, that the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Do you remember at Christmas time, the angel said, what on earth? Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. When Jesus comes into the world, that was the message. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. He's riding in now. He's heading to the cross. And he's weeping because they don't get it. They're saying, come save us from Rome. And Jesus is saying, no, this isn't about being saved from Rome. This is about being saved from my Father. This is about peace. There's a peace thing that's being brokered here. And you don't even get it. You're missing it. You're missing the whole thing. If you read later, the rest of that in Luke, he predicts the fall and destruction of the city of Jerusalem, which comes through in 70 AD, just like he said. And I've noticed something in the 50 plus years I've been on this earth. Uh, I've noticed this world is filled with people who regret their choices. Many of y'all did this. We regret the choices we make. And sadly, the world's filled with people devastated by their choices. Would you agree? Think about some things. I'm just throwing some things out there like the parents who didn't have time for their kids. They were so busy working and trying to keep up with the Joneses that they just sacrificed their kids. Or worse, they were out playing with the Joneses and, and threw their kids off on other people. And then when those kids grow up and self-destruct, Sadly, this is what happened. Sadly, not my fault. The school's fault. The church's fault. The grandparents' fault. It wasn't my. Every now and then you'll see a parent that'll be broken and realize it and go, what have I done? Or a young man that made a quick decision, a real foolish decision, and ended up wrecking his life, not just part of it, his entire life. I, I talked to a kid like that last year. A stupid, split-second decision wrecked him for life. And he regrets it. Listen, many of us have made those kind of decisions. Would you all agree? Big regret decisions. And those people are carrying... We had the youth here last Sunday night. There won't be any youth tonight, but we had the youth here last... And I got two volunteers. I'm not going to say who their names were. And we got to see how many hymnals they could hold. And so they grabbed the hymnal. And, oh, this is not... I can hold three. And both of them could hold three. And I said, that's great. Now I'm going to show you something else. And I had them hold it at this level and hold it. See how long they could go. Well, this boy just imploded. And they flew all over the place. I said, don't worry about it, it's okay. Now this guy over here, I'm going to say his name because his head will get big and I don't want Caleb all prideful and stuff. But <laughs> Caleb held on to it, but I could see him struggling. And then it just happens. It, nobody can sit there long. You can take the biggest bodybuilder and give him a 25-pound dumbbell and say, just hold it like that. They can't do it for very long. Something happens, something gives way. That's what we all do with the regrets we have in our life. We're trying to hold it, trying to hold it together, trying to mask it, trying to hide it. And then when we want to break, like maybe cry or break down, you know what we do? Just hide it. 
and we're trying to we're trying to get peace, but we don't have peace. Do y'all, am I hitting home anywhere with y'all? We just got all these things we wish we could have done right and should have done right, and I can't believe I made that decision. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I stole that. I can't believe I ran from the conflict. I can't believe, and we're carrying all this, these burdens. And you know what? Everybody comes to me and says they'll come to me in these counseling sessions. This is what they say: Just tell me what I've got to do. To make it right. I met with somebody last week, and that was what they said. Just tell me what I've got to do to make it right. And this is what I wanted to say, and I didn't, and this is what I wanted to say. It's taken you 12 years to wreck it this bad. I can't tell you what to make. Listen, this is what I want to say. You can't make it right. You can't. It is so broken and so devastated. The only thing that will make it right is what church? Jesus Christ. When Jesus wept over the city, he is looking at a city who for thousands of years has wrestled with God. For thousands of years has made the wrong choices. For thousands of years turned its back on God. For thousands of years would come back to God and sing praises only to turn around and chase another false God. For thousands of years, God would send his messengers to him and they would kill him. For thousands of years, and Jesus is coming into the city saying, God wants to make peace with you. And they're going to kill him too. What God is inviting all of us to do at Easter, listen, if God wanted us to fix what we have wrecked by working at it, He would have told us what we needed to do. Would you agree? But Christianity teaches something. It's by grace that you're saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, and this gift is rode in on a donkey into the city, and they don't want the gift. They want to be delivered from Rome. They want to be delivered from their problems. They won't want any regrets. They want everything fixed. But I don't really want Jesus. Just fix our problem and we'll do whatever. But Jesus is saying, no, I don't deal with sin this way. God deals with sin through what Jesus is going to do, not what we do to fix it. That's why the Bible says we are all like sheep gone astray. We have all, listen, we have all turned every one of us to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Have you ever wondered why they call it the Passion Week? Because Jesus had a passion to come and seek and to save what's lost and to fix what's been broken. But the only way it's going to be fixed is if we turn to him and put him in the rightful place. You ever seen the movie The Passion of Christ? Raise your hand if you've seen that. Let's do something better. Raise your hand if you haven't seen it. Oh, Y'all need to watch. Very biblically accurate. There's some parts in it that are not. But there's a scene when I went to the movie theater, and I'll probably try to tell you about it because it moves me. There's a scene where he's taking the cross down to where he's going to be crucified, and he falls down. And Mary's right there, and Mary runs to him. And she's seeing him as every mother sees their grown adult as a little child. And she has a flashback to when Jesus fell when he was little and she ran and says, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And she runs to him and says, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And I'm, I'm watching that scene. I'm like, oh, that was done. This is how I am. I'm technical. I said, oh, Mel, you did that scene. Perfect. But then something happens. The music kind of builds. Jesus gets up off the ground, kicks the cross up, starts to stand back up. And he looks at his mother. And he says, I am going to make all things new. And I lost it. God so loved us that Christ had to go through that to bring peace between us and God. And listen, to bring peace between ourselves. Some of us have been carrying around all this guilt and shame for the sins we've committed. And Jesus is saying, I want them. Give them to me. That's why the Bible says that the iniquity, God laid our iniquity on him. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all of us. 2 Corinthians 5 says, For he 
made him who knew no sin, Christ was holy, all God, all men, holy, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He put all of our wrongs on him in order to bring peace. And that's why the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. The unjust is you and me, by the way. Listen, the things that we do, the choices we make, seem very innocent to us. But it wrecks us and it wrecks others. And when it says Jesus suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, he's talking about us. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And so Jesus wept because they didn't understand. Listen, they didn't understand and we don't either. If we understood, we wouldn't sin as much. And God lays out this choice for everybody all the time. And there's people that will choose Christ and there's going to people that are going to reject. There's going to some that will cry out, save us, Hosanna, and there's others that will say, crucify him. We don't want him in our life. And listen, nobody's going to be in heaven against their will. Nobody. God invites everybody. But the Bible's very clear. Not many are going to accept that invitation because most of us are saying, I don't want Jesus in my life. Crucify him. Don't bother me. Deliver me from Rome. Deliver me from the speeding ticket. Um, my house is on fire. Get my kids out alive. But other than that, don't bother me. But then there's others that are going to recognize I am a wreck and I am broken and I need somebody to fix me. I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. I need healing. And they're going to cry out. There's two thieves. We're going to see that next week. Two thieves on the cross. One's going to reject him. What does the other one do? He said, remember me. And Christ said, surely today you'll be with me in paradise. Listen, God so loved the world. When we talk about love, it's patient. God so loved you, he's not giving up on you. He's patient. God so loves you, he's kind. He, he knows and understands what you're dealing with. Listen, this one is a good God so loved you, he keeps no record of wrong, and if you'll ask him to forgive you, he'll erase all of it. The other day, I've noticed something. I drop fast. <laughs> yeah, not as fast as I used to. God's redeeming me. Not as fast as I used to, but I still got fast. And I always thought God just protected me. I don't get pulled. Now, that's not an excuse. That's still sin. Amen, Jay? Not obeying my government authorities, correct? But the other day, a couple months ago, I was in a rental. My car was getting worked on. And I was coming up 17. I was, well, coming down 17. I needed to get over. And I crossed over right there in Lowe's. You know where that silent line is? And before it turns... Yeah. I, I looked in the rearview mirror. There was nobody there. I didn't see the cop at the light, though. I wouldn't do anything really bad. I was just cutting over before the dotted line because, you know, it's tricky. So I pull over. By the time I'm getting up to the next light, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. And then I couldn't see who it was because this is what I said in my heart. Is that John? <laughs> I hope it's John. Uh, I hope it's not Kevin. You know, I don't think Kevin's going to let me off. Um, and, I, and I'm saying all those things. And, and I pull over and, and pull into the, uh, the strip mall there where the McDonald's mall is. I pull in. He's got the lights coming. He walks over. And I roll the window down. And this is what he did. He went, oh. What are you doing? I said, I was just trying to get over. He said, there's a line there for a reason. Don't do that again. Thank you, Rabbit. <laughs> and he, he let me off. Now listen, I did not deserve to be let off. I broke the law. Why did he let me off? Because he knew me. I didn't do anything to deserve to get off. I didn't bribe him. I didn't work. There was nothing I could do. Matter of fact, I think if I said to him, hey, let me give you some money so I don't get that ticket, I think he'd have been mad and wrote me a ticket. 
He didn't write me a ticket because he knew me. What Jesus is doing is giving an invitation, and this is what Easter is all about. He is saying, just like Israel, you don't know me. You're doing all the religious stuff. You're, you're going to synagogue. You're, you know what's right and wrong, but you don't know me. And he's weeping because he's standing at the door knocking. Nobody's willing to open the, the door. Listen, he wanted to save the whole nation, not just the city, but they didn't know him. There will come a day when all things are complete. All the prophecies will be fulfilled. End times will be over. We will stand there. And the Bible says there's coming a day when there's going to be two groups of people. In the Bible, there's a picture. God uses word pictures a lot. He said the sheep will be on one side, the goats will be on the other. The sheep are the ones that recognize they were broken. And said, Jesus, forgive me. Remember me. And Jesus turned and says to the thief, surely you'll be with me today in paradise. The other one that didn't want any part of him will be gone. Now listen, this is a scary thing. It's the scariest verse in the Bible, but it's true. He will look and say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never, what? Knew you. Knew you. And that word know is an intimate relationship. I never had a relationship with you. The sheep over here, he knows them because he took their iniquity and he became their iniquity and he declared them holy and righteous. He let them off for breaking the law, not because of what they did, but because he knows them. And on that judgment day, this is a bad illustration, but it'll make sense. On that judgment day, as they stand there, he's going to say, Father, I know him. Let him off. I paid for that. The ones that reject him said this basically to God. No, I'm going to pay for it myself. And God will say, done. And write a ticket. Somebody asked me the other day, why does, God, why does a loving God send people to hell? I said, a loving God doesn't send anybody to hell. He gives them exactly what they want. If they don't want God in this life, they will not want Him in the next. And all hell is is a separation. It's a bad place, but it's a separation from God. Jesus has come at Easter to broker peace. So church, this church is going to be full next week. It will be. And so can we do something as a church family before we leave? Two things. One, if you've never received Christ and asked for that forgiveness, and say, I want peace between me and you and between your Father, and receive that, we need to, that's the most important thing you can do. The second thing is, we're going to have a lot of people here next week who don't know Him carrying all this burden. Can we begin to pray for service next week and pray for the pastor and the people that are coming? That God will show Himself strong and they would come to know Christ. Because the days are drawing short, aren't they? And so, as we leave here today, I'm going to pray for that. And then we're going to sing a prayer song as we leave. Lord, I need You. And if You need Him, You come down here and grab me. And we'll do that today. Let's pray. Father, I do such a poor job of explaining the things you showed me. Your heart's desire is for peace. You do not delight in the death of the wicked. Your word declares that. It is your will that none should perish. Your word declares that. But Father, our brokenness, our sinfulness makes us so hard to you. We don't seek you. We all go astray all our own way and there's none that seek you no not one and so you sent your son to come and seek and to save that which is lost father we pray that next week those that we love and those who don't know you will come to know you to experience you to know that you're real and father for those that are so hard like the pharisees who just want you out of every aspect of the world just to murder you and throw you away May they recognize it's not a lack of evidence. It's that they're scared that it might be true. And if it is true, they need to humble themselves and pray, seek your face and turn from their wicked ways that you can heal them. Help all of us, Father, to turn to you, realizing we can't fix it. Only the great healer can. And all God's people said, Amen.